we here at Attack of the Killer Podcast pride ourselves on giving you the best representation of the topics we choose. So when we say we're going to talk about Boris Karloff, you know we're going to pick the films that best showcase the man's talents (laughs) and not films that barely have him in it. That's the Attack of the Killer Podcast guarantee. (laughs) Boris Karloff on this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. Attention planet Earth and beyond. Stay tuned for Attack of the Killer Podcast. 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 What? Good evening. I am Insane Mike, and this is Attack of the Killer Podcast. Ah, ah, ah. This is episode 299, and we have dug up a frighteningly entertaining show for you all. Tonight we are going to be talking about the legendary Boris Karloff. I'm not going to do that voice the whole time. Oh, okay. Now, if this is your first time listening to Attack of the Killer Podcast, let me explain a little something. We're a horror movie podcast. We're a group of friends. We get together with a topic, and we discuss films within that topic. We're just friends hanging out, talking movies, talking about Boris Karloff, so there may be spoilers. (laughs) And we may or may not be talking about Boris Karloff with these movies. We'll see. (laughs) It is October, boys and ghouls, the Halloween season. And soon it will be time to go trick-or-treating. Now, if you want to give Attack of the Killer podcast a treat... We will give you many tricks. <laughs> you know, tad oh. uh, Help support our show through our Patreon. And with your support, you become part of the Attack of the Killer podcast family. We call those people the attackers. Now, as an attacker, you get all kinds of perks and content as a thank you for your support. So much extra goodies that you can get that I can't even do it justice. But I'm going to try. Uh, you get bonus episodes, early access to the main episodes, YouTube shows such as Killer Critiques, Video Updates, and Insane Mike's Women in the Top Ten list, your own membership card, certificate, and sticker, invites to our watch parties, exclusive chat, our ex- and our exclusive chat, Attack of the Killer Chat, and our monthly horror hangout. Original art by me called Mikey's Monsters. You can ask questions for upcoming bonus episodes, a playlist of the Attack of the Killer podcast music. Uh, you can get to pick a movie for our Patreon episode. You, get, you can get your own Attack of the Killer podcast t-shirt and even get shout-outs on the website and on the show, like right now, this very second, like these amazing attackers right here. Like Timothy Lenner, Roman Doppelfeld, Larry Watanabe, Brett Royer, Seth Key, Jessica Irish, Chris Cook, Brian Godsill, Stefan Sitter, Brandy Moore, Andrew Moeller, Rod Hutchinson, Carmen DeHaig, Abraham Moreno, Jacob Book, Andrew Bentler, Casey Kelderman, Tony Miller, Mike Clayton, Rose Talshoma, Abe Kirshner, Lisa Cavalier, Holly Berg, Bill Fisher, and Greg Diedrich. What a list. All you've got to do is go to jointheattackers.com, pick the tier that best suits you, and become an attacker. Again, that website is jointheattackers.com. And and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce you to the podcast crew. He wanted to build his own Frankenstein monster. He couldn't finish because he had to place an order on Amazon for more lab equipment. It cost him an arm and a leg. Jason! Oh, hey, everybody. Happy Halloween, and thanks for listening to our little show. His best friend was a mummy, and they drifted apart because he was wrapped up in himself. Tad! <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for listening, guys. They just hired a new guy at his work. His name is Igor, and he has a good hunch about him. Brian Clark! <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> hey, buddy. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Thanks for having me back. So, Brian, uh, what you got going on? Tell us a little bit what about uh, what's new in your world. Uh, I've been writing stuff. I have a new book out. <gasps> Actually, I think since the last time I was here, I have two new books out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. Um, I put out a collection of original short stories called Putting the Ground to Sleep and Other Weird Tales back in April-ish. And then just 
at the end of September, I released a novelization of the public domain Roger and Gene Corman produced horror flick Beast from Haunted Cave. That one's fairly hot off the presses. I mean, yeah, it's still a, warm. My yeah, copy's it, warm still. It, my impetus for finishing, like I've been picking away at it for a while, but my impetus to finish it was I wanted to have a second book on my vendor table at Halloween of Palooza. Aww. So I was like, that's my fucking deadline. Yeah. That is, that, so that was the debut of my, of yeah. my book. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Where can people get your books if they're not at, if they didn't get them at Halloween of Palooza? Uh, they're on Amazon.com. You can get a print copy, you can get an ebook, or if you have Kindle Unlimited subscription, you can read them for free, and Bezos still has to give me some money for it. Yes! <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us for this episode. Couldn't think of a better person to help us talk about. Oh, Bo- and oh yes. One other. Oh, I, oh my I almost forgot. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Whoa. <laughs> I did some more voiceover narration. Now, uh, oh, cool! Last year, you know, I I did a little bit of work for uh, my buddy Andrew's band, Coagulate, mm-hmm. uh, doing some interstitial narration, spooky voice stuff. Well, he has a new project out with another friend of ours. Uh, it the album drops on Sewer Rot Records November third, uh, but st- exclusively streaming on Ken's Death Metal Crypt. There will be a a uh, sort of premiere, I guess, an advance screening, <laughs> streaming, screaming, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> on Halloween. Awesome. So it's called Adversion. It's a symphonic ep- space opera, weird tales, <laughs> death metal thing. Think the band Balsagoth, but heavier. Right. Uh, right. You know that band. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool people do. Uh, <laughs> everyone's like, so, oh, so it, it, it's this grand operatic concept uh sort of like is it like lovecraft robert e howard clark ashton smith in outer space with monsters and cults and it's it's really fucking cool and uh the the ep that's coming out soon will have a preview track of the upcoming full length where the orchestration stuff is going to be done by christopher kotze who is the apprentice of harry manfredini Oh, cool! Wow. So it's got some horror ties in. Nice, in yeah. And That's where awesome? Where can people find find all, all this wonderful music? Uh, that will be, like I said, November third. It'll be out. Uh, you can find Sewer Rot Records on Bandcamp, but okay. look up uh, just Google Ken's Death Metal Crypt, and on Halloween you'll be able to stream the whole thing to to get it. Awesome! A taste. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Oh, and well, we've got some stuff going on too don't we Jason? speaking of streaming that's right guys guess what what next episode is the 300th episode wait is that right it's true i looked it up wait let me count them all real quick One, two, three, four, five. 300 i know yes. it's exciting and so to celebrate our 300th episode we're gonna be giving you that's right you listening a chance to be on the episode i can be on it that's right ted well i still have to let you on it if you but I'll I'll think about it. If Pat, I, I know you forget a lot of times you are on the episode when we're recording, but you are on every episode. But uh, so we have a Facebook event going. If you follow us on any of our socials, we'll be putting that out there um, on Sunday, November fifth at eleven a.m. We're C- going to be Central Time. That's right, Central Time. We're going to going live on YouTube, and I think it's it'll also stream on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff too. But YouTube's where to go, and um, that's Sunday, November 5th at 11 a.m. Join us. Um, We're going to be talking about movies that you've watched because of this podcast and liked it. That part's important. None of the ones I've picked for the show. (laughs) Right. (laughs) A very short episode. (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't be on it. Oh, uh, yeah, fuck you guys. Anyway, <laughs> no, yeah, that's going to be great. Come hang out with us for our 300th episode. All right. Um, but until then, let's go over to Tad and find out what we watched. What we watched. Well, we're all on our Halloween Palooza hangover, but there's plenty of spooky season left. Not to those who are listening. I'm sorry. It's just past. But for those on the show, 
I'm hoping you guys have been catching up on some good horror. Jason. Oh, fuck. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. <laughs> what have you watched? Oh, well, when it comes, I've seen one film, and I'm, I'm lucky I got it in there since Halloween blues it. And if there was one film that screams Halloween and screams spooky times and is just the epitome of the season, I finally watched Barbie. That's right. Nice. Barbie. Nice. It was great. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, Michelle just was waiting for it to hit streaming. And so we uh, finally sat last Saturday, had some time, and we got to watch it. And um, she doesn't watch a lot of movies, but like she, I don't think she blinked. She was just into it and loved it. And it was so smart and so great. And Are you guys going as Barbie and Ken now? That is a great idea. And Jason's going as Barbie. That's right. <laughs> Good call. That's something me and Nikki would do. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it is something you would actually do. I actually thought of a great I- idea for a costume like Saturday, and it, it was too late. We thought of two or at least three better costume ideas than what we're doing this year, and I'm pretty pissed. Mm. But one of them was uh, sort of a, a gender fun thing that I like to p- play with. Oh, I got to I, I got to keep my back pocket for. Yep. yep coming years Anyways. i guess there was there was one more thing i i just missed it on the letterbox um but it was a big thing and i i think i binged it in two days and it was the new fall of the house of usher we're on episode three i'm loving it so far yeah man mike flanagan's new uh, series it is awesome his and, final netflix series and we'll see they all see final oh it is he's he signed a new contract with amazon oh um, I, I love it. Uh, back when I used to remember how to read in school and stuff, <laughs> I, uh, I loved Edgar Allan Poe stuff and, and it really helped me get into poetry and I love it a lot. And, um, at least I remember a lot of that. And so what I thought was great about the show, I just, besides it being fucking awesome, a, a, a great way to tell all his stories is that just the way they incorporated uh, the literature into the script of the of the show it was it's really great so like you get plenty of opportunity to like hear his words on screen and it and i feel like it works every time it's not like they're trying to shoehorn it in or anything and i don't know i just appreciated it and and love getting to hear it and because it's mark great. hamill fucking rules in this mark hamill whoa Kicks. Now, now I'm a lot more interested that Mark. He Hamill's, is such a different, yeah, you, a different role for him. He is fucking. He'll he take just, an episode to recognize him. He's yeah, that. and he's fucking great. I'm, I, I was blown away by him so far. That he has hooked me into it. Absolutely, an yeah. evil bastard. So I was, I was a little iffy on this one because I, uh, Haunting Hill House is great. Yep. I really like Midnight Mass. I thought Bly Manor was awful. I so, never made it to that one. I never hey. did. It. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm not gonna. Great. Um, I thought that uh, Henry Thomas was also way outside of his comfort well, he's, zone. He's fucking Ben he's Killer fucking and all this stuff. Awesome. He, he should be. He should be everywhere. He really not just should. Flanagan stuff. Again, I completely agree. But within the Flanagan verse, like Henry Thomas is doing something in this show that's just. I, I love his character. He's just so great. But um. Yep, and love it. So that's uh, it. Just two days, I just binged the shit out of it. It was awesome. I loved it. That's what I watched. All right, I'm gonna flip it. How about you, Brian? I'm sure you've watched some weird shit weird that none shit. of us have ever heard of. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. I've been on a kind of a Hong Kong movie kick uh, lately. I I don't know. I, I love that all these boutique labels are getting into releasing a lot of this stuff. So, like, uh, the one I watched most recently was uh, Ghost Nursing from Vinegar Syndrome, which is a fantastic... I don't know what was in the water in Hong Kong this period. That, like, this and Devil Fetus and <laughs> the Demon's Baby were all kind of coming out around the same time. Really weird fetus monster movie. But it's it's very, very cool. I've uh, been keeping up with Ultraman Blazar, the newest Ultraman series from Tsuburaya, which is like the best ultra thing since the 90s probably it's fucking amazing and is currently sort of carrying the entire tokusatsu genre on its shoulders but uh, you can watch that for free on youtube on subaraya's uh channel i've been getting a lot of jean rollin movies on 4k from indicator 
So this isn't a new to me one. I've seen it before, but I really liked it. I want to introduce Terry to John Rollins' movie. So I thought Night of the Hunted is a little more normal, a little mm -hmm. less artsy fartsy. So we watched it, and I said, "So what did you think of that?" She goes, "Well, the first half was kind of like a soft core movie, but it was kind of interesting, I guess." So <laughs> not a total loss. I love that one. Uh, I watched Rocktober Blood for the first time. Uh, cool. About a month ago, when I went up to my buddy Andrew's house to do the narrations for this new Adversion thing uh, that's coming out. And uh, so it's a weird little late period slasher movie by the husband and wife filmmaking team who made Gator Bait. Um, so it's uh, like you just, like we watched it on his old VHS. Hmm. Uh, apparently they put out a Blu-ray of it. Like they, they went all Christian at some point and refused to acknowledge any of their exploitation films and then relented a few years ago and put out a Blu-ray of it, saying that, oh, it's remastered, and it, but apparently the Blu-ray was just like a like a burned disc with a VHS rip on it. So Ew. <laughs> there was like some big scandal over the whole thing. <laughs> um, and then, uh, also due to my buddy Andrew rewatching these and, and talking about them, and I hadn't seen them in ages, I rewatched uh, Children of the Corn 2 and 3. Now, hmm. This might be blasphemy around these parts, I know, but I don't like Children of the Corn. I think that movie is fucking boring. But two and three are nuts. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever watched the sequels, but two has some of the funniest fucking kills in any horror movie ever. They're just hilarious. And it kind of knows it. Like Some of them are meant to be serious, but a couple of them are very obviously in on the joke. And then part three has a fucking corn kaiju built by what? Screaming Mad George. <laughs> Fuck yeah. That, that spears a, a a young Charlize Theron through the crotch with a root like in Evil Dead. Why isn't that shit on the poster? You need right? To be <laughs> she just be Charlize Theron with a root in her crotch on the poster. Children of the Corn 3. Uh, yeah. But anyway, those are all on HBO <laughs> right now streaming. So, yeah. You can ignore the first Children of the Corn, but watch the sequels, at least the first couple. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, that first one, it's, it's, I, it's yeah, slow. Yeah, I, it's I slow don't one. think it's a great movie. I think it's yeah. like it's got a cool lore behind it, and you know we're in the Midwest. People always associate it with this area, but uh, it's not like rewatching it as an yeah. adult. Not Not so good, guys. I also love how all the sequels are based around the idea of, well, one of the kids from Gatlin, or in the case of Part 2, the entirety of the children of Gatlin have to go into foster care. And then something goes wrong, like the foster parents can sense that they're evil. Like, that's just the only way they can figure out to, how to write themselves out of that hole of, how do we get out of this fucking town? It's got to be one of the weirdest franchises. Something, you know, an fr entire franchise built on a short story yep. and just keeps going. Somehow they just keep, they, they kept making them and then re they've rebooted it twice. I remember we had a video store called Circus Video here in, in Burlington and uh, my brother rented them one by one and we watched them. Uh, and this was like the 90s, so I think at the time they went up to like three or four or maybe. I don't remember. But I remember he had, like, the posters. Like, they would, when they had, you know, it was video stores, they'd get the posters, and when they take them out of the light boxes, they would roll them up and put them in this big, like, bucket barrel thing. And for, like, five bucks, you could buy them. And he bought, like, Children of the Corn 4 poster or something. And we had it, he, like, taped it on our bed. We had a shared bedroom. We had this tiny little house, and he had it, like, taped up. And it was just, like, out of all the fucking posters, like, Children of the Corn 4, like, just was... Yeah, just so stupid, but it was just like something we loved watching, and it would be interesting to sort of watch those now because I haven't seen them in years. Yeah. How many are there? Do you get anybody know off the top oh, of my head? Oh god, there's like seven or eight of them now. I think there's yeah. a bunch. I know Shutter uh, just re rebooted it. Yeah. Oh really? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Shutter, well, Shutter shot one and like. Not Shutter themselves, but whoever yeah. they, they picked it up for distribution. But this one that was filmed in like Bulgaria during COVID, it was like the only place like they could find that would allow production. So it was sort of controversial. Like they filmed it in 2020 during COVID. I yeah. count seven of them. Yeah. Seven of so them, including both remakes. Because there was a Sci Fi Channel remake. Yeah, there's the Sci Fi oh, Channel remake ago. one too. Which was My buddy has filmed in Iowa. Eight now, so. yep. 
My buddy has a tolerance for direct-to-video garbage from the 90s that would Ugh. make any one of us blush. <laughs> and in, even he says, stop watching after part four, because five is awful and it gets worse from there. So <laughs> take yeah. that for, for how you will. Yeah. Well, is that, is that all you watched? Well, God, I no, mean, but I it's you, been like a year saying, since I've been here. So you're, you're, we could just make night. an episode. We should have just had like a What Brian Watched episode. <laughs> yes. How about One of you, these Mike? Days. What have you watched recently, Mike? I'm pretty proud of myself. I think Ooh. this is the most I've watched uh, in between episodes ever. Um, it's still only four films. But uh, I watched Totally Killer, Ooh. which was really good. I yeah, thought it was a last. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Really funny. I love the whole satire of the um, generational differences. Um, that was just so so much fun. Um, and I, you know, you know it, it uh, gets tricky when you're dealing with time travel. Um, but I thought they handled the whole time travel stuff pretty pretty decently. Uh, let's see. I also watched, finally watched, Simon and I watched, uh, Super Mario Brothers, uh, just last night. So, and nice. that was also a lot of fun and holy crap. So many references. Just the, so just many. the score alone is so many references. Like I could barely hear the movie cause Simon's <laughs> like, Oh, that's the music from, from Super Mario does Dallas. He's in his and, element. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally in his element. I played the new one, the new... Uh, a Wonder? Yes. Nice. I know, that's surprising because I haven't played Weird. a video game in about 30 years. <laughs> um, but I was at a friend's house and he bought it for the... Uh, Switch. Jesus Christ. Yeah, Switch, thank you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> someone at the party, like it was like a get-together and they're like, hey, you got Mario Wonder, let's open it up. And we we passed the controller around and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I love. I mean, there's not a bad Mario game. Mario's so much fun, but... Yeah, uh, this isn't what we played. So, what else have you watched, Mike? <laughs> True. Uh, also, Simon and I, we just we just did a marathon on. Oh no, it was Sunday. Yeah, we just did a marathon on, of movies on Sunday. So, uh, next up was Strays. That was mm-hmm. hilarious. And yeah, you know, it's a good thing my son's like fifteen now. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, dirty talk. Uh, dirty. Yeah, a lot of dirty talk. Well, just a lot of the funniest scene, man, to me. It's that scene where, you know, try not to give too much away, I guess, but the scene where they are in the pound and they come up with their plan. <laughs> the poop scene? No, before the poop. The poop, the poop. Oh, the poop scene was too much for me. The poop me stuff too. was Just too stupid. much for me. But the, the original plan. With oh, the, oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> With the red, red rocket. rocket. We'll just say that, yeah. <laughs> that was freaking hilarious. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun, really funny. Uh yeah, definitely don't watch it with your kids unless they're 15. So anyway, uh, and then the last thing I watched, um, the bottom of my list on purpose, uh, that new Zombie Town film on Hulu, which is an R.L. Stein joint. Uh, not good. <laughs> I was pretty I, disappointed. I'm just like floored by this. It's like a f- weird. This this movie barely got like announced. It got made. It has Chevy Chase and uh, Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd in a R.L. Stein movie went straight to Ugh. Hulu, and it, like even Hulu's embarrassed of it. I think <laughs> they're like they, they've like buried it. There's like nothing out there. For yeah, it. Well, they haven't promoted it at all because I'm I'm guessing it's awful. Yeah, it's sadly not good. Well, and it's also got it's also got a couple kids in the hall, and it. it's got Scott Thompson and um, Bruce McCullen uh, show up in it. And I just feel like all of these classic comedic actors are a thousand percent squandered in this film. I mean, Dan Aykroyd gets the most screen time, but he's really, it, you know, storyline and plotline is the exact same thing as uh, the Goosebumps movie with Jack Black playing R.L. Stein, which I love that movie. That movie is great. But it's it's note for note the same thing. I mean, if you were to so take Dan out Dan Aykroyd plays R.L. Stein, not R.L. Stein, but it's the same thing. It's like, oh, this recluse artist who keeps to himself because he has a hidden secret 
Um, and all of a sudden, his art has unleashed something evil on this town. And it's up to the kids and this uh, this recluse artist to save the day. It's, that sounds like the Goosebumps movie, right? That's exactly yeah. what this is. And Dan Aykroyd plays this horror movie director who's made all these great horror movies and has this huge fan base. But he made this one movie that didn't show and... He retired after it, and come to find out, this the, the reels of this movie has this curse that turns the town into the most pointless zombies ever in any zombie it movie. Sounds sort of a cool concept, but uh, not executed well, huh? No, because at least in the Goosebumps movies, it has kind of more of like a Gremlins feel to it, where maybe it's not necessarily um, like life-threatening, dangerous, but there's still an element of like of um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking danger? for? Danger. Da- yeah, thank you. Yeah, danger. I guess. Uh, with with you know the different Sweet. monsters and stuff chasing after him and whatever. Uh, but everybody just in this town turns into just slow limbering, lumbering uh, zombies that that don't even eat people. They just uh, so just Chevy Chase in real life. they just like kind of shuffle around and they'll chase after you but for what purpose other than to just you know go all life force on you and uh turn you try to turn you into a zombie as well Well, hang on now chevy chase and dan Aykroyd are clothed during this movie right you said life force (laughs) and i got this horrible (laughs) fucking image in my head uh, the kid actors were not any fun at all. There's a group of there's a group of three like horror movie fanatics that is the worst representation of horror movie fanatics ever. They are so over the top. No horror movie uh, fan ever acts like this. It's whoever wrote this movie. Well, I'm, I don't I don't know if Arl Stein wrote the script or if his just name is slapped on it or if it's based off of one of his properties, but uh, they have no connection to. One, uh, you know, the youth of America at all, but in particular, like, horror fans. You know, because apparently this whole town um, is named after this director, and everybody are big zombie movie fans, and and it's just, it's just so, it's so unrealistic as far as the characterizations of these uh, horror movie fans. So, it was sad, it was unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, I'd stay away from that one. But, Tad, what did you watch? I've watched all kinds of stuff, but I'm not going to go one by one. I mean, if there's a silver lining to having COVID is that I was, like, (laughs) quarantined in the basement with my giant, beautiful 4K TV and nothing but time. Uh, So I'm I'm looking at my list. I watched uh, new stuff, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. Which is yeah, a prequel to the remake. If that, you know, they went the okay. whole Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning. Yep. Uh, I didn't love the reboot, but this one was pretty cool. Uh, has David Duchovny in it. Has a pretty good cast. Uh, I really, I mean, maybe being, you know, sick helped things out. But it has Henry Thomas in it. He's fantastic. Has Pam Greer in it. David oh. Duchovny. Uh, they have quite the cast on this one. Really, really good cast. Um, it's set, I think, in like the 50s or 60s. Uh, so I love that. It was really well done. Like, this is a full-on production. This, you know, straight to Paramount Plus. Um, and it's, it sort of came out of nowhere. Everybody was sort of shocked that they were continuing from the reboot with Lithgow. Because it was just sort of like... That movie just sort of came out and existed. It wasn't awful. It wasn't good. It just, you know, didn't make much of a splash. So to, to yeah. continue that with a prequel was interesting. But I recommend checking it out. Uh, if nothing else, some really good performances. And it's pretty fucking dark and haunting. Uh, hmm. Not so much. I mean, there are, but it was more about people than pets this go around. Which, you know, the original is too uh, when it comes down to it. But. Um, what else? I watched a ton of rewatched a ton of classics from this time of year, but one is another first time watch, The Curse of Frankenstein, uh, from nineteen fifty seven. I picked up the uh there's like a really decent Blu ray out there, like I think it's uh, I'm trying to remember which label it's 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 like 
Amazon has these sales on these, and I picked it up. Screen Factory, isn't it? I don't think this one was. Um, I think this one's like a Warner Brothers Classics or something. They they oh. put out some decent transfers, and uh, this was really cool. Like I I had never seen this, um, but I've always wanted to dig more into this stuff, and uh, I think maybe like watching it. Uh, close to Halloween on without having like to be forced to watch I pick it up off the shelf because I'm trying to like knock some of these you know I, I have so much to unwrap we're never going to catch up on the podcast so I'm like <laughs> I need to just make a pile and this is like the cover alone just screams like Halloween I mean like, outside of the universal classics nothing says Halloween like a Hammer movie right yeah. and my, that's you know Hammer's been hit or miss for me since you know no pun intended uh, since I have sort of dove into it for the show and i was like maybe if i just watch this one without being part of an episode making it feel like homework just watch it it's always better to watch a movie and mike doesn't uh recommend it so yes uh, that's just a yep t-shirt so that, i'm working on yes yeah so that was a lot of fun uh i watched never hike alone 2 which i mentioned on the bonus episode i i count that because it was yeah. quite a bit of fun and then joe bob show demons 2 which we recently watched and all hollows eve which uh is only watchable if Joe Bob's talking about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then uh, right after All Hallows Eve, I was like, Joe Bob was only four hours tonight, which if you're not a Joe Bob fan, that sounds crazy. But, you know, four hours is a short episode for him. <laughs> yep. Um, so I was like, what's on TV? Oh, Turner Classic Movies is showing The Haunting from 1963. Uh, started watching that and chatting with Brian back and forth, and he was like, I think I've seen like parts of it or something, but I never sat down and actually watched it. And he's like, you know, oh, Raimi got a lot of uh, inspiration from like camera angles and stuff from this. And I was like, I'm sold. I'm going to sit down and watch this based on that. And I fucking loved it. It was cool shit. Like I've just been in that kind of mood this year for Halloween season is like old timey stuff. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, 60s, 70s. I mean, I always am, but like it's like no in betweens for me. It's like, Black and white, or like came out in the last few weeks, it seems like. Um, <laughs> and then the last thing I'll mention is something that Nikki and I watched uh, just last night. No, uh, Sunday night was Cobweb. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Nope. No. It's a new movie. It hit theaters like very shortly. Like it was like very limited theaters. Um, Basically, this little boy is. They move into this house. He's hearing shit in the walls. Um, you think he's. You're not sure if he's going crazy or if there's really shit in the walls. Um, Gross. And it has Lizzie Kaplan as his mom and Anthony Starr from The Boys as his dad. Oh, uh, sold. And Cleopatra <laughs> Coleman, who's really good, is in this. Uh, but uh, Anthony Starr, he is a sadistic motherfucker. Um, I honestly believe he's just an um, evil fucker in real life, too. But in this thing, it's like, at first you think they're just, like, overprotective parents, and then you start learning some weird shit, and it turns on to, like, a full feature creature, or, or creature feature. Oh, cool. Uh, I won't spoil anything, but um, it's pretty fucking fun, and it is not just a horror movie. It is Halloween-themed. I mean, they have, like, a pumpkin patch in the yard. It's set during Halloween. There's mm. kids in masks, so I was like, I got to check this out. I loved it up until a reveal, um, and then I still liked it. I just didn't love it as much as I wanted to. But I think uh, you guys that like uh, – try and think of what I would – I'm not going to compare it to anything. Just if you like creepy sort of uh, crawly Halloween movies, it it's, gets pretty gory. It's a lot of fun. Oh. I check it, – it just hit Hulu Saturday this past weekend. So okay. uh, check that out cobweb it's cool it's a little uh snuck under the radar if nothing else i feel like it will start popping up on the year-end episode so i think this this okay, one okay. it came out at the same time as like a bunch of other shit and it was not on the radar and now it's hitting hulu i think it's gonna start getting word of mouth so that's what i watched sweet all right thanks ted okay so let's get into our topic boris karloff so boris karloff was born so, uh, Tad, what's our first movie uh, when talking about <laughs> Boris Karloff? Our first film is The Son of Frankenstein. There's a man like a destroyer. 
But as a scientist, I should do everything in my power to bring him back to conscious life. Benson, turn on the generator. Produced on a vast scale, Son of Wittgenstein presents the most fearsome cast in the history of the screen. The Rathbone. In his heart, warm human emotions. In his mind, the monster mania. Karloff, rising from the past to spread new terror. Ugosi, sinister, mysterious, evil. Lionel Atwill, grim hatred in his blood. I heaven might think you're a worse fiend than your father. Where is this monster? Where is he? I'll stay by your side until you confess. And if you don't, I'll feed you to the villagers. <laughs> that, that's a w- way to end it um, returning to the ancestral castle long after the death of the monster the son of Dr. Frankenstein meets a mad shepherd who is hiding the comatose creature to clear the family name he revives the creature and tries to rehabilitate him uh, I can't remember if this is I, I, this can't be my first watch but it's been my, it's the first watch in a long time and this movie fucking rules uh it's right up there for me with Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. It's it's so much fun, uh, but it doesn't have as much of the like humor. Some, every time I watch Bride again, I forget some of the little like weird humor and stuff that's put into it. This one feels. You mean you forget Uno O'Connor making you want to jam a fucking screwdriver through your eardrums? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know some of that shit. It's just like, but this is this is a lot of fun. This is really cool. Uh, this was like a perfect October watch to me. Um, and I like the changes they make to the monster, but I love... It's a very simple story. It's, you know, sequels before we really... Everybody did sequels. So it's sort of interesting to think about, like, how you... How do we make more money out of, you know, this huge hit we had with Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein? Well, son of Frankenstein, you know... Uh, and it's it's very like I said a very simple idea of what if the doctor had a son who came back and he's like I want to clear the family name what should I do you should probably just fucking throw the creature in like a shredder and <laughs> never speak of it that the saying exists but no you know it comes back and it's it's back to the shenanigans of oh no it's it's accidentally it's misunderstood and it's accidentally killing people again you know and it's just, it's it goes back to that but I like that so. <laughs> I'm curious to hear what... I mean, I, I assume everyone likes this one, right? Yeah, it's the first time for me, and I, too, fucking loved it. it was, yes! It was great. <laughs> yeah, enjoy it now while you can. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I know, I know. No, Take but the wins. Yeah, no, this was fucking awesome, man. I loved it. I loved it. It was great. Yeah, the changes were awesome. Um, it was just amazing having just... All those heavy hitters, uh, you know, besides Boris having Bella. Anytime those two were in the same, it was awesome seeing Basil so young. Everything, man, it was it was good. It was really good. For me, I think the out of the original, uh, original, original horror actors, uh, Bella's always kind of been my favorite, I think. And... I love this movie because of Bor of of uh, Bella's uh, uh, Igor. Uh, he steals the show. I think this is his. I I prefer this performance over Dracula. I think this is probably one of the best things he's ever done. And uh, Fuck just yeah, yeah, uh, just every time he's on screen, um, I I'm all in. He and it, what's cool is like this is the third film in the franchise, and this goes into this whole, whole, uh, you know, bleeding into our culture thing. 
the character of of Igor isn't ever doesn't ever show up until the third film with uh, Bela Lugosi, and something clicked that uh, I uh, Igor has always been associated with Frankenstein, and also interesting is that the spelling has changed over the years too. It's mm-hmm. like spelled with a Y in this movie. Uh, hopefully, I'm not stealing all of Tad's trivia, but no, no, you're no, good. that's my job. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't what trivia. We have Brian Clark here, guys. Now I will say, you can make a very fun drinking game out of every time Doctor Frankenstein says experiments, because uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, that that word is way overused in this movie. Um, but it's it is just a lot of fun. Um, it's the last of Boris's. Uh, uh, theatrical uh, monster, and you know he knocks it out of the park once again. It's interesting, uh, you know. There's there's some continuity uh, errors between Bride and and Son, where you know Bride in Bride, you know the monster finally speaks, but he's mute again in this in this one. Um, you know, but I, but also at the same time, I just, I kind of forgot like how, how connected a lot of the, the earlier films out of the franchise was. So I thought they did a great job, uh, with that for the most part. And yeah, everybody's just great in this movie. Uh, it's probably one of my favorites out of the Frankenstein universal, uh, franchise. Um, also it really dawned on me this viewing too, that this one is probably the most influential on Mel Brooks when he did Young Frankenstein. Yeah, I, I was mean, thinking that the whole time. Yeah, which is probably why you said Frankenstein earlier, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In particular, the Inspector character, like, yeah, I'm like, oh my god, like Mel Brooks straight just, out of here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who's uh, other than the part where he's relating his childhood trauma of having his arm ripped off? Yeah. Lionel Atwell in this is almost as funny as the inspector <laughs> character in Young Frankenstein with just his movements of that arm. Yeah, it's the <laughs> movements of the almost the same where he has to use the other arm to lift the the fake arm up and push it back down. I was just waiting for the dartboard scene and when the dartboard scene showed up I'm like, "Oh, please tell me he's going to put the darts in his <laughs> hold the darts in his arm like he does in Young Frankenstein." So, yeah, that was uh, that was uh, really eye-opening this time around watching this one. It never really dawned on me that this is probably... And what's also interesting is that in this movie, um, the worst part of it is the small child, uh, Frankenstein's Ugh. son. But if you do the math, that kid grows up to be Gene Wilder, young Frankenstein. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, it's somewhere great. between here and there, he lost the Texas accent. <laughs> what was that? What was that about? Donnie Dunnigan was from Texas, <laughs> and he was like four, so he couldn't not have the accent. <laughs> couldn't cast anybody else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. And it's funny because not even like he's still kicking around and he does interviews and stuff. And as an adult, he recognizes that it's fucking ridiculous. He he will straight up say. I don't know why they cast me. And he was very shy about it on a movie set, right? So he was speaking very quietly, trying to you know, just get through his lines. And they'd say, no, you got to speak up. But the louder he spoke, the stronger the accent got. Mm, gotcha. Because he was the, he was, wasn't he also the voice of like young Bambi? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So Brian, your, your thoughts on this one? This is by a significant margin, my favorite Frankenstein movie. Okay, cool. I Aww. fucking love this flick. So I was excited to just, you know, I get to sit down and rewatch it. Um, not that I need an excuse. <laughs> but again, it's largely because of Bela. Like, this is his yes. movie, and this is his finest hour to me. And he's very nearly as good in Ghost of Frankenstein, which is the next one, too. And it's it's cool that they keep the continuity going. Um I think actually Karloff's best performance on one of these is in Bride because he gets to speak, so there's a little yeah. more nuance to the role, um, and, and he's you know completely outshined by Bela. He was originally supposed to have a lot of dialogue in this, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But this uh, say, is so. Well, huh? So what's up with that? It goes from he goes from not talking, talking, then back to not talking. I'll, I'll let you get to it. <laughs> well, before first of all. I just 
something if you ever run into one of those pedantic schmucks who is like well actually frankenstein <laughs> is the name of the creator not oh, the right. creature well guess what motherfucker in this movie so it's canon not only <laughs> Have the villagers decided that the name Frankenstein is interchangeable between the doctor and the monster, so that the villagers do call the creature Frankenstein? The infamous deeds of Henry and his creation have cast such a shadow over the land, they even renamed the whole fucking village Frankenstein. Because <laughs> yes, exactly. when, when the train's pulling into the, to the station, and he's saying something like... Uh, Wolf, Basil Rathbone, is, is saying something that the sentence is going to end with him saying Frankenstein, and you hear the conductor saying, Frankenstein, Frankenstein, and they're announcing the fucking station they're pulling it to. <laughs> so Frankenstein is the doctor, the monster, and the town. Suck it. Yeah. <laughs> but why would you do that? Why would your your darkest moment in your town's history <laughs> and then you rename your town that? They renamed Haddonfield Myers. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it makes any sense. I'm just saying it's in the movie. <laughs> yep, yep, no, yeah. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> so, uh as Tad was saying, you uh the, uh, how can we milk some more money out of this? Well, if you notice the release date on this, this is 1939. So this takes place or this was made 4 years after Bride came out. Um, am, I, am I getting my date wrong? Well, anyway, uh, there there was a lull in horror because in 1934, this asshole named Joseph Breen became head of the Production Code Administration, and he was a right wing Catholic psycho who was determined that no one should ever get to watch anything that he didn't like. Not just that they were going to censor movies, but that he was going to influence the types of movies that got made. Huh. So. Horror was at the top of his shit list, and by 1936, he had basically browbeaten all of the studios out of making horror movies. So, but in 1938, uh, there was a theater in Hollywood owned by a guy named Emil Ullman. It was he was on the verge of bankruptcy. His theater was going under, probably because this fucking douchebag Breen was ruining everyone's fun. So he decided he was going to show a triple bill: Dracula, Frankenstein, and Son of Kong. The program sold out every single showing for five straight weeks. Yeah. And ain't no one going to get in the way of Hollywood making money. Nope. So Universal <laughs> dusted off the coffins, fired up the strict fad and generators, and we got Son of Frankenstein. And they dumped a ton of fucking money into the production, too. It was written by Willis Cooper, who was the creator of the Lights Out radio series. And the original draft, like I was saying before, had the monster a lot more at the forefront. Uh, and when Wolf digs into... he Wolf gets a... It's one of those, like, come claim your inheritance kind of things. Except it, as a stipulation in, in Henry's will, the monster has to remain inactive for 25 years in order for his heirs to... So it's like he's putting the, the onus on his heir to clear the family name, right? So Wolf goes home. He uncovers the ruins of the lab. He actually finds the remains of Pretorius, the homunculi, and the bride, but he doesn't find the monster. So he's like, oh shit, well clearly the thing's still out there somewhere. I have to stop this or I don't get my inheritance. The monster comes forward, threatens to kill his wife and kid if he doesn't make it another mate, and at the end is actually just about to perform brain surgery on the boy to, to take his normal brain out to use to put in the mate because, of course, there have been a bunch of misadventures through you know getting the wrong brain, damaging them, so on and so forth. And uh, the inspector not only knocks him into the sulfur pit, but throws a grenade in after him to make sure the job <laughs> is taken care of. Uh, but, of course, the finished product then has the monster relent before killing the child, because even though horror was back on, it wasn't quite that back on yet. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are conflicting reports as to whether the final script was actually written by Cooper or if the director uh, had a much heavier hand in the rewrites. But the changes were being made even during the shoot, so it's kind of amazing the movie turned out as good as it did. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite moments, again, it's a Bela thing, not a Karloff thing, is uh, <laughs> when he's at the police station and they're questioning him and they're saying, like, the, the same jury who killed you before will kill you again. And he's like, ah, but some of them are dead. And the one guy's like, well, I'm still alive and I was one of the eight jurors that killed you before and I will gladly do it again. And he starts coughing, just yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. all over the guy. Like, you spit on me. No, 
bone gets stuck in my neck. Make me cough. <laughs> and as he's walking out the door, his cough turns into a laugh. Oh, my God, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a great scene. Well, was it was it in Sun or is it Ghost where... I think it was in Ghost where the monster did have lines, but they they cut them out in post, right? And but you, if you watch that, the movie, no, that, you can still see him lipping. That's the in words. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Oh, that okay. Because that's that's where Bela ends up playing the monster, and he was oh, supposed yeah. to speak in Bela's voice because it may, like he's got Igor's brain Igor's in the brain. monster's body yep. now. But there oh. there are con- again conflicting reports of why the dialogue got cut either. It didn't sound good. A lot of it, uh, a lot of people say it was because they thought Bela sounded funny saying it, but that's stupid because he was fine as Igor, so why would it not? I don't know. It was one of those, like, eh, no one's really going to know for sure what what the story was there anymore, but uh, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But Karloff has nothing to do with that movie at all. So yeah, yeah. I'm surprised we didn't watch it for this episode. <laughs> he did have his 51st birthday during the shoot of this film, and on the same day his daughter was born. So it was a pretty good time for him. Whether whether or not the acting role was uh, was a primo gig, but yeah. And spoilers out there listening. <laughs> this this is the one of the three that has the most Boris Karloff in it. <laughs> Uh, well, Tad, if there's any left, what trivia do you have for this one? There's all kinds left. Um, in discussing the monster makeup for a newspaper article, the legendary Jack Pierce stated that the metal studs in the monster's neck were really electrodes, inlets for electricity that brought the creature to life. And this is the first film in the Universal Frankenstein series to show any wires actually being connected to the electrodes. Um Cool. Boris cool. Karloff used a harness when he carried Donny uh, Dunnigan so that the little boy would not fall. And Dunnigan has related how much he enjoyed working with Karloff. So it's always nice to hear like that the uh, the adults weren't complete assholes to the children. I yeah. would probably be, but uh, <laughs> and then the the last thing was uh, Frank Skinner's musical score for this film with its slightly off key horns and plucked strings replicating a human heartbeat was endlessly recycled in the universal horror movies throughout the 1940s. <laughs> what? Recycling stuff in other films? What? It's cool that it like had its origin here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and wasn't it also true uh, that uh, they were originally going to do this one in color? Yes. Yeah, but uh, yes. again, Jack Pierce didn't think the makeup looked right in color, so they just went back to black and white. Yeah, I had that here. Let me see here real quick. I I had that one pulled up, but it was like the the piece of trivia. Let's see. Plans were discussed to shoot the film in Technicolor, but the decision was made to revert to black and white. Both director Lee and co-star Josephine Hutchinson verified in years later that the film was designed for and shot in monochrome. Urban myth has it Karloff's the urban myth has it that Karloff's makeup f- photographed bright green and was a primary reason for shooting black and white. Oh. Uh Another urban myth has it that Dwight Fry was in Technicolor test reel and this subsequently dropped from the cast. In the late 1980s, a reel of Technicolor test footage was discovered in Universal's vaults but was either stolen from the desk of the executive who was in possession of it or simply boxed back up by bureaucrats and shipped to, New Jersey, to a New Jersey film vault. The Karloff family home movies shot on the set of the film revealed the monster's colorization to be grayish with subtle highlights and shadows of blue, green, and brick red. The brief clips show Karloff and monster makeup sticking his tongue out at the camera and pretending to strangle makeup artist Jack Pierce. <laughs> uh, you can find these clips on the CD-ROM, the interactive history of Frankenstein, <laughs> <laughs> courtesy of Sarah Karloff. So, yeah. Cool. Nice. Thanks, Ted. Of course. All right, so moving on to our next movie. It's from 1963. It's called Comedy of Terror. Starring 
Vincent Price, who, inspired by a seductive woman, is overpowered with lust to kill. Peter Lorre, too sensitive for both the life he lives and the lives he takes. Mm. Butterfingers. Boris Karloff, the ancient one, with a fount of sweet memories. Alexander the Great embalmed in honey, so they say. <laughs> Abundantly blessed, Joyce Jameson, an unhappy, unkissed bride. Aren't you coming to bed, husband? Rhubarb, the cat in the house of unholy horror. <laughs> Amazing Joey Brown. Shockingly amazed. <laughs> and inimitable Basil Rathbone. Have it, you, sir! Whose wrath will slash you to the bone. A mad killer, like the angel of death, stalks his next victim. You're here because you're dead, Mr. Black. The hell I am! In a small New England town during the 19th century, dishonest undertaker Waldo Turnbull, played by Vincent Price, runs a local funeral parlor. Having financial problems, Waldo and his sidekick Felix, Peter Lorre, start creating their own customers they cannot find when they cannot find willing ones. And it also has Boris Karloff. This is a first time, <laughs> first time watch for me. Uh, which I I don't know why this one ever eluded me, but wow. I really love this movie. I I thought the the humor hit just right for me, and I like I like the the story idea and the whole plot of this. Uh, I think it's fun and funny and and a little dark. Um, this has got to be probably now one of my favorite Vincent Price performances ever. Oh my God, he's he is just the highlight of this. Such a despicable character, but you just can't take your eyes off him, and it's just so. He to just me, it's so choose funny. Choose it up. Choose the scener scenery like no other. Um, but he and it also for me it really shows that the man has chops for comedy. Uh, I mean, I knew it all along oh God, with his yes. appearances on the Muppet Show and stuff, but whatever. Uh, in this era of AIP horror comedies, where they use actors known for horror instead of using comedic actors, you know, having like Peter Lorre in the scaredy cat character instead of like a Jerry Lewis or Bob Hope or the Three Stooges, I, I, I really, really like it because it's, it's more on a, it's, it's a lot more subtle than saying, you know, like from the Three Stooges or something. So uh, that that more subtly realistic approach to the comedy of it really, I think, works way better. And so just really, really enjoy this movie. Everybody, I feel like, is in top form and proves that they all have, even Boris Karloff has, has some gift for comedy and wish they could have gotten more opportunities to, more opportunities to do such. Uh, my only thing, I if I had to point out just one opportunity, I feel like the cat thing was underused. Like they build it up so much in the opening credits and all that that this cat, the cat, is going to play um, a significant part in like the plot or what have you. That uh, some mischief is going to happen because of the cat. Not really. Just the cat is there, just witnessing stuff, and so that oftentimes you forget the cat's even there. But but that's just a small thing for the most part. Comedy of Terrors is great and so much fun. I hi, I personally highly recommend it, but uh, I guess we'll find out uh, how everyone else feels. 
Well, this is one of my favorite horror comedies. There we I'm go. Sure that's not at all a surprise to anybody. Like you said, like the the dark, macabre, just mean spirited tone of the whole thing. Again, Karloff has some great moments, like like mm -hmm. that bit in the in the trailer that you just played, where he's like, yeah, "Alexander the Great and Baldwin and Honey," or so they say. <laughs> but when he's <laughs> bitching about his daughter trying to keep his medicine away from him. That is a little oh, grating yeah. to me. He's like, you don't want me to have my medicine. And he's just banging his fist on the table. But he's, he's a little wasted. But he was originally supposed to be the Basil Rathbone role, so he would have had a little more to chew on. But his health was getting so bad by this point that he wasn't able to do the athletic Shakespearing. Uh, <laughs> but like as... Dear friend and attacker Tim Leonard says, just putting Vincent Price and Peter Lorre next to each other is a sight gag. Like, <laughs> yeah, they don't even sure. have to say anything for that to be funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. True. It's just it's true. But it, the, the bit where they're breaking into the house <laughs> and he's making him climb up on the roof. <laughs> I fucking love that shit. Oh, if you want more of Vincent Price being really fucking funny, even more so, I think, than this one, Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. I fucking love that movie. Vincent Price is amazing in it, and the theme song will be stuck in your head forever, but that's not what we're here to talk How's about. Good? Dr. Goldfoot, <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo, and the Bikini Machine. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> oh, this isn't the last time I'll be singing on this episode, oh. be forewarned. Uh, this is originally supposed to be a follow-up to The Raven, because they wanted to reunite Karloff, Price, and Laurie. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, The Raven was a big success. Eh, this one, not so much. But uh, both written by Richard Matheson, who's the one who talked AIP into getting Jacques Turner to direct. You would not guess from watching this that it's a Jacques Turner movie, because, I mean, there are some cool shots, but, like, Jacques Turner made Night of the Fucking Demon. It's, like, one oh, of the yeah. greatest horror films of all time. <laughs> And this just kind of looks like a Roger Corman Poe movie, which were also gorgeous, don't get me wrong, mostly because yeah, of yeah. Daniel Haller, the art director. But, um, And like all three of the movies this uh, have Karloff and Basil Rathbone in them. Yeah, yeah. Which were, they were also but, great in this. Yeah, Basil. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Rathbone's thing with the, when he's reading Shakespeare to wind down to go to bed and it gets him so worked up that he jumps out of bed and pulls a sword <laughs> off the wall oh god yeah absolutely so this is the first time watch for me it was a lot of fun again where i'm watching this and i'm like this is a vincent price movie oh yeah but that's not a complaint if if this is how i'm gonna get to watching it um because again this is one i i think I, I mean i've heard of this title a million times oh and yeah i've heard people you know oh it's one of the best horror comedies and i enjoyed the hell out of it uh again vincent price hilarious and just takes control of the screen i mean what else can i say that brian hasn't already said it's fantastic uh recommend it i'm glad you picked this one uh, I, I and just the chemistry between everybody's great too. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love the just the saturation and color of this era of film too. Mm -hmm. Like again, just sort of has a certain feel to it. You know, it's not. It, it, it's just a product of its time, which is cool. Yeah, and I'm. Um, it's the first time for me, and I, I mean, I'm with all you guys. I think it was great, and. Uh, I don't think I can say anything that you haven't said. My only, <laughs> the only thing that was, uh, I don't, I just, uh, I'm not saying it's not okay because it's obviously okay, but from it was just weird to see them doing comedy and like, just uh, not used to it. Yeah, and I don't know that it's, I don't know, I don't want to. I about said something I would have regretted, but I mean, like, you know, I just. It just took, takes, I don't know. It's it's good. It was funny. I Say it, Jason. I don't know. I it's just like, I don't, it's like, it's, it's like, I don't care. Cause I don't, it's not the, it's not a horror movie to me. It's not, 
it's not the guys that I I know I can watch any of the other movies to get the things I wanted out of them. And I, it's great seeing um, them act their asses off and have fun. Vincent Price is just great. And but you you want them like when you get this kind of cast together, you you want them to make like a spooky horror movie, and it's more and, slapstick comedy. And and I just don't care about a slapstick comedy. I just it doesn't. I don't. It was good. It was funny, and it was done well. It's not, and, I get you because it's not something I'd normally watch. Yeah, either, I just don't, like outside of the gotcha. show. It doesn't okay. interest me because I don't. It's not what I want them for, and it's just more yeah. just a curiosity for you to just know, like, oh, these guys can be funny too. But yeah, yeah, not not not. What but you there's want. a disconnect for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's all I'm saying. But yeah, no, I mean. We can all watch Vincent all day, any day, doing anything. Yeah. So and when Peter I see Lurie him now, cooking shows, I watch him do a cooking show. Right. I wish I mean, he did a fucking cooking show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have his cookbooks. Yep, yep. I was gonna say, off the mic for five straight years, I tried to convince Andy that we needed a video series of him <laughs> cooking oh. as Vincent Price. Yes. Oh, that would be great. Oh but my that would have been such a production. So. uh but, but man, yeah, you could have crowdfunded that shit. I would have. <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah, that would have broken the internet with. Well, greatness. Andy, Andy <laughs> had the cookbook and would make stuff out of it too. Yep. And yeah. it was like, you got to record this. He's like, no, I don't want to record myself cooking. That I'm was like, I... one of the things he and I would talk about because like, we didn't talk a ton <laughs> off. Like, obviously not like you guys did, but because we weren't in contact like every week. But we would like text each other when we were making a Vincent Price recipe or something. You know? <laughs> awesome. awesome. That's so funny. That's awesome. Yeah. Something you'll never hear on a, like another podcast. When we were texting each other, you know, oh, have you tried this <laughs> Vincent Price recipe? How are his wings? Uh. <laughs> oh, one more thing. This one's just for Mike. Uh, the minor role of Mrs. Phipps. Uh-huh. Did you recognize her? No. That was Beverly Hills, who also played the drunken shrewish harridan in the Filipino exploitation classic, The Brides of Blood. Oh, nice. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. Very cool. Okay, uh, Tad, what trivia do you have for this one? Well, I had to go through and like take out half of it as as Brian was revealing yep. it, which is which yep. is great. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, man. I no, don't mean no. to. No, please keep, I love it. keep yeah. doing what you do, man. <laughs> I feel I love fucking it. bad when I'm on here and I just step on your... No, no please sure. step it's, all over me. Cause, it's uh, less work it, for Tad. <laughs> It's less oh, you're into that, are you? Do you, want, you want, want me to wear heels? And it's and it's more organic when he just comes up in conversation from you. Yeah. Um, so I, I pulled out some other ones that I thought were interesting. Um, I'll start with the downer. Peter Lorre died only two months after this film's release. Uh, it, it seems like, uh, yeah, sort of like almost a sort of a sad look. I mean, obviously they're all older in this movie, but you know, the, the first one I, the first fact I had was that Brian mentioned was that Karloff was originally hired to play John F. Black, but because of his severe arthritis, he couldn't do it. Um, so it's like it's bittersweet to see them all in here. Cause knowing like they're towards the end of their careers and lives. But uh, this one is, is more fun. The hearse coach used at the beginning of the film now resides outside of the haunted mansion at Disneyland. Oh, nice. Cool. So the original hearse, you can check it out in person. And uh, in the early, this is a fun one too. In the early stages of development, the title Graveside Story was considered as a parody of West Side Story, which is popular at the time. <laughs> it was discard- That would have been a great title. Right. Yeah. It was discarded when it was felt that people wouldn't get the joke. The final title, The Comedy of Terrors, was chosen as a play on Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. Yeah, okay. So, uh, but I like Graveside Story. I yeah, think me that's too. <laughs> they should have just kept it. It's like Spider Baby's alternate title, cashing in on "It's a Mad, 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 Mad World." Yeah. Was that enough Mads? I don't. I never know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, saving the best for last, Jason. Yeah, what do we got? <laughs> All right, guys, get ready. Uh, get your beach towels out and uh, <laughs> fill up your beach balls because. <laughs> It's 19. Oh, my balls are full. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go back to 1966 with The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini. She's the 
swinginest ghost you've ever yearned for, haunting a pre-will reading seance. I thought I made it clear to you and your wretched crew that you would be disposed of everybody before I read the will. What you have to do is to see that my rightful heirs get the money. Yeah, man, here's one haunted house the M Gang wants to investigate. What are all these strange people doing here? Make the music pretty, play a happy song. Make the music pretty or I can't go on. Everybody singing about a broken heart. Don't you know, can't you see it's tearing me apart now? Make the music pretty and I'll tell you why. Make the music pretty or you'll make me cry. Let me hear you play a happy melody. Come on and make the music pretty for me. Television repairman. Just take a look into my eyes. Looking for maybe sex and the single ghoul? Oh, ah, ah. more than everything. me all the time. Geronimo, guys. Uh, Hiram Stokely, played by Boris Karloff, a recently deceased man, discovers that he has only one day to enact a good deed in order to avoid eternal damnation. Hiram's scheming lawyer, Reginald Ripper, played by Basil Rathbone, is determined to get his fortune and it will and is willing to bump off potential heirs such as Chuck Phillips and Lily Morton to achieve his goal. As Chuck, Lily and others have a lively pool party. That makes sense. Hiram <laughs> recruits the ghost of his dead lover to help set things straight. This is the seventh and last of the American International Pictures Beach Party films. I know, only seven, guys. It's a bummer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is a movie. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Mike was uh, t- telling me about it last night, and I, only, I really just finished it right before Mike got here, so that was awesome. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But uh, the chatter definitely uh, prepared me for this musical. And uh, Mike said it best last night, really. So I'll just hand it over to you, maybe. Just... I love how you described it. It's as, <laughs> it's as if someone had a beach party movie script, but the only location they could secure was a haunted house set <laughs> on some studio lot somewhere, so they changed the bare minimum of the script just to fit the location because everything else plays like a freaking beach party movie. You're Down to not the far wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like literally watching it. It's awesome because um, it, there's a gorilla suit. There's a gorilla in it. It's I awesome. always love a haunted house movie with a gorilla running around loose in the haunted well, house. That's how I love my beach party films. So well, that's that out. too. Yeah. Then other monsters in suits. Um, this movie's. Uh, I didn't even. I didn't even mind the the music of the band that kept cutting in. Didn't. I, I didn't mind the music in it. It was all right. Um, my, my, only, my one of my biggest questions is like. Um, I think it's near the end. Uh, there's a, a storm breaks out during one of their dancing, and I'm like, 
And they all freak out and run inside. And I'm like, it's just water. You're all dressed in bathing suits. Why? You guys are, are in and out of the pool. Right. What's, why are you so scared of rain all of a sudden? Anyway, but uh, yeah, this movie's fucked. I mean, <laughs> awesome, but wow, huh? What, huh? What do you guys think? I I like the movie as it is. I putting it in this context with these two movies um, on a horror podcast uh, <laughs> with the topic at hand. Uh-huh. It's like it's bare. I mean, uh-huh. it breaks every rule of what we're trying to do. But it's got a uh, ghost in it. But sure. two I yeah. I think most listeners know I have. An affinity for 60s music, uh, you know, Beach Boys. And Beach Boys were in some of these weird surf uh, beach movies. Uh, Monkey's Uncle, some of that stuff is is really fun. Um, so mixing, so trying to sort of mix this haunted house thing with it. Um, if I'm in the right mood, it would probably be a lot of fun. But um, again, it's it's such a weird collaboration i don't i don't even know guys like i I didn't hate it as much as i mean i was messaging the group like mike and jason i'm like you know it's not too late to choose a different movie because uh (laughs) this is like the the fourth song maybe i just wasn't expecting i should have with the title um it just (laughs) doesn't i don't know it's not a bad movie on its own. It just doesn't belong on yeah, this it is. show. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, but it's so it's so f- out there. Like it's so I don't know. It's, it's such out. a weird experiment. The band playing on the beach, and I was like, the guitars fucking rule, and the parties look like fun. Uh, the music sort of catchy, but it's not what I w- want to have for Attack of the Killer podcast necessarily. <laughs> but um, I didn't hate it. Next. <laughs> do you want to go mike or do you want me to do <laughs> uh, i'll go i'm just gonna say this one this one really misses the mark for me um and i don't know if i wasn't quite prepared for it to be i mean i guess again title right but i wasn't quite prepared for it to be a beach party movie just lazily turned into a haunted house movie um but i felt like and, and I know, again, you get this with beach movies, but they usually work for me in beach movies, but not this one. But there was way too many characters. I uh, felt like half of the running time of this movie is just introducing characters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with the, you know, constant teens having dance parties by the pool. Just like, if you take all of that stuff out, you've got like a five-minute movie. Um the titular character, pun intended, um, uh, her her motivation and tactics are very unclear, and it's the laziest effects ever. I mean, ever. you 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 could say, well, it was the you know the times and stuff. I'm very forgiving of effects because of eras. That's fine, but this is the laziest thing. It's just her always facing forward, same. You know, it's like they shot all of her stuff against the green screen, or back then it was probably blue screen. Um, I forgot what color her bikini was. Well, I mean, I think that was, it was part invisible. of the point. Yeah, because it's invisible. But um, I assumed it was named after they fucked up and the maybe. bikini was gone. That's what <laughs> yeah. I assumed. Okay, you're probably right there. Because, um, yeah, the where the bikini is, you see right through it. <laughs> invisible bikini. Um, but like she's always facing forward, and proportionately, she is the same in every shot. Even though characters that she's supposed to be standing next to are maybe further back in one shot, and so she looks like a giant compared to them, or they're closer, which makes her look tiny. It's like they shot all of her interactions at once, yep. and then just tried to make put it, it in, and <laughs> and that's even more apparent when her whole mission is to fuck with these people so that the reading of the will and you know the inheritance gets to the right right people but it's like the things she does to mess with everybody are just things that just would have happened anyway and like and it didn't make any sense that uh what she would the things that she was doing to cause the chain of events for the outcome that she was wanting so yeah it was very uh 
yeah, it did that whole, th- you know, her whole thing just felt very, very, very tacked on and just was not into it. Um, what else did I have in my notes? Um, yeah, so it just, at the end, it just felt like, you know, lazy writing. Um, like, and it was one of those, like, where script, where with the script, one of my pet peeves in comedies, especially goofy comedies, is where it feels like the joke comes first and they write the script around it instead of jokes being written into the script. Uh, my best example of that in this movie is you tell me that a motorcycle guy and a truck couldn't have avoided landing in that lake. Right. That was that was like the worst thing ever. They had like a mile between the between them seeing the lake and crashing into it, and they're not even really going that fast. But oh, it's so wacky! We landed in a lake. Anyway, biker gang. This movie's awesome. <laughs> you got your stereotypical All the... beach party biker gang shows up in this movie, <laughs> blasting through the billboards. And then we won't. And then I'm assuming we're just going to avoid the uh, the racist stereotype. Yeah. Indian Eesh. character. Yeah. Okay. Chicken feather. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was going to be supposed to be played by Buster Keaton, but he died right before they started filming. Oh. Okay. Uh, I was going to say good for him, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I said it anyway. Uh, so, Brian, why don't you go? So, all the stuff you said about the lazy stuff and it all, her things feeling tacked on and none of it making any sense, that's all a lot truer than you might think. <laughs> so, this was, orig- this was originally called Beach Party in a Haunted House. That was the hey, name of the fucking hey, script. There we go. And it was sort of the last gasp of the popularity of AIP's beach party movies. The Frankie Avalon, and Annette Funicello stuff like Beach Blanket Bingo, which I love a lot of the like Beach Blanket oh, yeah, Bingo specifically is fucking great. And yeah. uh, Jason, what you're talking about, that the biker gang? It's the same fucking biker gang in all oh, of these shit. movies. <laughs> yeah. Literally. I yeah. thought they looked familiar, but you know, I just thought they were just <laughs> awesome. all cookie cutter the same anyway. So they decided to, because the the uh, Roger Corman Edgar Allan Poe movies are also really popular at this time, but I mean, well, those were kind of on the way out too. Um, and so they decided to reuse Daniel Haller's sets from a lot of those Poe movies to save some money. It was originally written by Lou Hayward, who was a gag writer for Ernie Kovacs, and Edward Ullman, who wrote a lot of Three Stooges shorts. And it was directed by Don Weiss, who would go on to work on the Adam West Batman TV show. So you can kind of see yeah. all of this like sort of borscht belt sticky <laughs> bullshit going on there. But so they finished the movie and it was a fucking mess. Like AIP it was so bad they didn't know what to do with it. So they just stuck it on a shelf. In the meantime, Jim Nicholson, one of the two main dudes of AIP, uh was having an affair with Susan Hart who plays who wound up playing the ghost in the invisible bikini, right? So she had done some minor stuff before this. Um, and he saw her and thought, Ooh, she purdy and <laughs> took up with her and, uh, wound up divorcing his wife to be with her. They weren't really good about keeping their affair secret in the first place. So the divorce is pretty acrimonious, but, uh, before they finally put this in the theater, she had gone to Italy because she was originally supposed to co-star in Mario Bava's Planet of the Vampires. Oh. But she was let go from that at the 11th hour for reasons that were never really made particularly clear. So Nicholson wanted to give his lady friend a part. And he was like, oh, we have this shitty beach haunted house thing that we don't really know what to do with. But my Mm -hmm. buddy Boris Karloff could use some work because you know his health is is waning and my girlfriend needs a role so i'll write this little uh-huh. uh, book ending thing with them in it and we'll just like oh, superimpose wow. her over the shots so oh, when you're talking wow. about like it doesn't match up with all that stuff it was literally because it was overlaid like a week before they put this fucking thing <laughs> in the theaters crap <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. So, and it's painfully obvious. Yeah. 
<laughs> not, not not all the jokes tank. I did enjoy the joke about Ripper, the lawyer, looking like Sherlock Holmes because well, fucking yeah, Basil Rathbone yeah. again, and he played Sherlock Holmes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the 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 best joke of all is that Susan Hart wound up never making another movie <laughs> because Aww. when when Jim Nicholson divorced his wife to marry her, his ex wife apparently had a better lawyer than he did. <laughs> And he lost half of his share of AIP in the oh. divorce, which made Sam Arkoff the controlling shareholder. And he was like, I ain't having none of this bullshit and completely <laughs> yeah. locked hard out of any of their other movies. And from that point, because AIP was still a big studio, the, you know, they were the, the minor major, you know, they were like the fifth big studio that, and so like, oh, no one wants to touch her. It kind of made her uh, cinematic. AIDS. <laughs> so everyone just, she got locked the fuck out. Um, there's some fun stuff in here, though. Uh, one of the eye creatures from Larry Buchanan's remake of Invasion of the Saucer Men pops up, you know, and that, that big, weird, lumpy monster that's in the bed. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. If you've ever, ever seen Attack of the, the Eye Creatures, as made infamous by Mystery Science Theater. And you're talking about the gorilla. That's uh, George Barrows, one of the classic Hollywood oh, gorilla it? men like Bob Burns. Nice. Who also played Roman and Robot Roman, Monster. Robot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As well as April's and a bunch of other movies. And although he wasn't in the suit, they used his gorilla suit to make the movie Conga with Michael Guff. Oh, okay. You've seen that one. It's a, a giant, giant ape. British some of, movie, it's a weird thing. But. Some of the some of the gorilla stuff is probably my favorite part of this movie, and mm -hmm. and that that's and, and so when you tell me that that stuff is actually tacked on, it makes makes it makes everything way more sense to me because for nineteen sixty whatever, Six. the gorilla suit is really good. It's not bad. It's a great gorilla suit, and then you get this crappy superimposed girl in an invisible bikini throughout <laughs> the whole thing, and I'm like. What what's going on budget wise with this? So I yeah, so I love yeah. the gorilla stuff. So you get all that stuff like, well, why does that guy's gun blow up in his hand? Well, I don't know. Let's just have the girl, the ghost girl, stick her hand in the muzzle of the gun, and it, or the why does the chandelier fall from the ceiling? Oh, because she was sitting on it. I don't. Know. Right. <laughs> God, this movie was hard to watch. Yeah, uh, I agree. <laughs> I agree. But I did want to say the one of the things I did like most about this to bring it back is is watching the Boris Karloff scenes. Like we got to spend some really good time with him, and it's yeah. just I love getting to see him be him and like get some speaking roles. I love the way he talks. He's got you know a, a long tongue, or you know he's got a thing, and it's just yeah. fun to see. And I love just getting to hear his voice and and see him act and. And I thought he got to do that in spite of what else this movie was. But I, I really liked that part about this movie. Yeah, the, one of the things, uh, I mean, pull back the curtain here a little bit. Uh, one of the motivations for the movies picked for this episode is is to try, picking ones I haven't seen before, which now seems obvious, uh, slash um, you know, films I feel like that don't get talked about in Boris Karloff's filmography. That's why I went with, like, Son of Frankenstein instead of regular Frankenstein. But the biggest motivation for doing this episode in the first place is I want you guys to see Targets. And, you know, and that's probably oh, yeah, even yeah, less yeah. of a horror movie than the rest yeah. of these. But and that's just, one that's not on, I have not seen that yet. And it's on my, like, I yep. need to fucking see this movie and I haven't. Yet. Oh, I love it. And it's worth it for, you know, it, it, it's worth it for the what you're talking about, Jason. Getting just those, and he's basically straight up just playing himself in that one. So you're cool. really getting quality Boris Karloff time. And he's got some epic uh, uh, speeches in it and... Uh, it's just a great movie, just but sat and I. It's probably one of my favorites of Boris Karloff's, and it's right at the end of his career slash life. And uh, but sadly, it just wasn't streaming anywhere. Yeah. So oh, I hear that movie's good. Yep. My thing with him in this movie is that it's nice to just see him like out of makeup and and. Yeah. But he he seems really sweet and nice because in real life. William Henry Pratt was beloved by everyone he met. Like even the rivalry between him, between him and Bela Lugosi is gets so played up. Like they yeah. were they were friends. Like Bela may have had some professional jealousy because Karloff's career got bigger than his, but they 
th there was never any open direct animosity between them because Karloff was just one of those guys you could not hate. Yeah. But his character in this is supposed to have been such an awful skin flint in life that he has literally been given an ultimatum that if you don't do one good deed yeah. from beyond the grave, you are going to hell. <laughs> and, and then he just seems too nice for that to make any sense. Right. Yeah. But then again, nothing else in this movie made That's any fucking sense either, so whatever. Little, it's so fine. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Tad, um, you got any trivia for this one? Not a whole lot left, but um, the Supremes were originally cast in the film but had to oh. bow out when filming was delayed due to prior commitments. Oh, and then they read the script, too. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, I'm sure they just like money. Uh, among yeah. the proposed titles for this film were Beach Party in a Haunted House, uh, Slumber Party in a Horror House, The Ghost in the Glass Bikini, and Pajama Party in a Haunted House. Oh, well, that last one's way too close to um, um, Monster... What's, what's the name of that one? Monster Crashes the Pajama Party. Oh, yeah, Monster yeah. Crashes the Pajama Party. Yeah, which I love that one. It's so bad, but... Okay, cool. I would like to give a, a shout out to uh, another good friend of mine and co-host of the Atomic Weight of Cheese on the PFPN, yeah. Chad Plambeck. Uh, he did an article for his blog, confirmedallen01.blogspot.com. I got most of the information that I related in this. For, he did a super deep dive article, like damn near wrote a book about <laughs> this fucking movie because the behind the scenes stuff is way more interesting than the movie so like go it, check yeah. out Chad Planbeck's blog uh, confirmed Allen zero one cool. blogspot.com if you want to know more awesome all right gonna do it all right so there you have it folks that's everything you need to know about Boris Karloff <laughs> yeah. we've covered the best of the best of his career <laughs> oh, oh. but there's still more Attack of the Killer podcast to come. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to finish off the show with our final segments. But first you're going to hear a promo for our podcast network called the Prescribed Films Podcast Network. The PFPN is home to over 30 different shows like I Like It Spooky Podcast. Welcome to the I Like It Spooky Podcast your go-to podcast for anything horror related where they always keep it spooky. Horror movie reviews, news, and more. So check out I Like It Spooky and all the other shows at thepfpn.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the show. Now it's time to hear from you guys, the listeners. Here's Jason with Shoutouts. It's time for Shoutouts! 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 All right, we asked, what are your favorite Boris Karloff movies? And over in our Facebook group edition, we got Timothy Lennerer. Woo! Attacker like Tim. Guy. Yeah, he's cool. Uh, he says, Son of Frankenstein is my fave from the original run of 30s Monsters, Monster Pictures, and from his late period work with Roger Corman. I have to go with A Comedy of Terrors. Yeah, I knew go. there was a reason he and I got along. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Both of those benefit from a deep bench of good supporting actors. Una O'Connor is one of is a one-woman disqualification for Bride of Frankenstein <laughs> getting on the list. <laughs> Honorable mentions to Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Ghoul, the, dark, the Old Dark House, The Walking Dead, You'll Find Out, the 1960s version of The Raven, and the unhinged mess that is The Terror, where you will see exactly how Karloff stayed in the never-not-dignified club, even in the least-dignified film. Do you think The Terror holds the <laughs> world's record for most directors? <laughs> Probably. It's up there. You would think. 
Over on our Facebook group, we got Attacker Emily. She says, House of Frankenstein, or I Walked with a Zombie. Oh. Mm-hmm. We got Calvin Goodlickson says, The Terror. We got Attacker Casey Kelderman. We like Ooh. Casey. He just yeah. did a little live podcast at Halloween of Police. Sure so much did. fun. So yeah, it was fun. a good one. Yeah. The Although old... I don't necessarily agree with that. Oh, no. It's in any order of that list. But yeah. <laughs> Screams from the basement on the PFN. Uh, he says, Casey says, The Old Dark House. Favorite rainy day horror flick. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. It's been raining, so let's watch it. Yeah. We got Nick Leadham. He says, Bride of Frankenstein. Unless... How the Grinch Stole Christmas Counts. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? absolutely. Uh, and he says, getting ready to watch it and the first one on the big screen now. Oh, awesome. Yeah, uh, the Grinch probably counts more than two of these movies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Carl yeah. in it more than, than half of the movies on this show, yeah. Uh, then we got uh, Trevor McElhinney, he says, The Mummy and Comedy yeah. of Terrors. Mummy, Man is that good? fine taste. The Mummy's fantastic. The Mummy's great, Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, a lot of people don't rate that one real high among the OG Universal classics, but it's one of my favorites. I think the ending is especially is really subversive, which doesn't really have anything to do with Karloff, but it's it's a whole religion thing, which is kind of shocking to see in a '30s movie. But mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had uh, nothing on X or Instagram, but over on Threads, we got Miriam who goes at Goth Stitcher. She says. Oh, my God, all of them. <laughs> LOL. Obviously, Frankenstein, anytime he plays the character. Bedlam, Corridors of Blood, and The Raven. All good. Yeah, yeah, great. Threads, Mike, it's cool. You should. I know, I need to check it out. I need to remember what it's called first, but, yeah. <laughs> now, so many people are saying The Raven. Are they talking about the 60s one that Roger Corman directed, or are they talking about the 30s one where he's teamed up with Bela Lugosi again? Oh, yeah. I, f- yeah, I kind of f- always forget about the Bela one. Yeah. I always My brain always goes to the... They're both good. Just one's a comedy, one's a serious movie. But. Yeah. And it uh, looks like we have a voicemail. Let's see who's drunk dialing us now. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea. Hey, everybody, Attacker Brian here for my bi-weekly phone call, and it sounds like we're talking favorite Boris Kor- Karloff movie. Yep, right. <laughs> I mean, say his name. I've been hitting this off too hard this week. Um, you know, The Mummy, Frankenstein, um, but probably my favorite, because everybody at my house loves Christmas, is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I think Boris Karloff does some voice work for that. Hell, I don't know. I'm three whiskeys deep, and I don't even know what day of the week it is after work what is he, this me? week and all that good stuff. <laughs> I hope this gets you guys a good laugh, and I hope you have a happy Halloween, because it sounds like that's coming up soon, or already happened. Hell, I don't know. I, again, I don't know what day it is, but take care. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween, Godzilla, <laughs> you crazy Turd. And Merry Christmas. Pal. Yes, all the things. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because he doesn't drink, so it's great. Um, yeah, so uh, that's right. You, too, can leave your voicemail on the show. Give us a call at 415-952-6857. That's 415-95-AOTKP. Leave us that voicemail, and we will put you on the show. It's obvious we'll play anything. <laughs> and that's shout-outs. Oompa Loompa Loompity Boo, Mike's got one more film to recommend you. Oompa Loompa Loompity Ick, now it's time for In Sane's Picks. <laughs> Oh, that was great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, guys. I have watched hundreds and hundreds of trash cinema, cinema over the years. Movies that would make you question all of reality. But I think the film I watched for this episode is so out there that it almost leaves me speechless. Almost. The film I'm going to talk about this time is Banned from 1989. Band is a horror comedy directed by New York exploitation filmmaker Roberta Finlay. 
We talked about Roberta when I covered The Tenement uh, from 1985, uh, previously on Insane's Picks. Here's what it's about. Uh, while laying down tracks at Impulse Studios, crazed punk rocker and horrible musician Teddy Homicide suddenly snaps and shoots up the studio, killing everyone with his machine gun. Then he drowns himself in the toilet. His soul remains in the toilet for 10 years until a, until the band... Band? I'm not stuttering. The name of the band is Band. B-A-N-N-E-D. <laughs> puts together enough cash to record their album at the studio and jazz guitarist Kent becomes possessed when he gets sprayed with toilet water. <laughs> I can't almost do this without laughing. <laughs> <clears throat> Kent begins to change from clean cut jazz musician into a spiked haired leather wearing punk. Can Kent's grouchy girlfriend and her flamboyant uh, Reverend Brother exercise the possessed Kent before it's too late? You'll have to watch and find out. This movie is crazy. Uh, fun fact, uh, this is Debbie Rashawn's first substantial ro role. She had a small uncredited role with only one line in Lurkers from 1987, which was also directed by Roberta. And Roberta liked Debbie so much that she offered her, to ro offered her a role in this movie. So, yeah, this movie's crazy. It's off the rocker. Uh, the comedy is way over the top out of any form of reality. Uh, it really feels kind of like a trauma film without the budget. That's right. You heard me right. <laughs> this movie is so cheap. It, it makes, like, the Toxic Avenger look like freaking um titanic or some shit i don't know how to wrap my brain around the idea that roberta finley made a comedy that is what messed me up too <laughs> i clicked on this movie not expecting it to be a comedy and right out of the gate and i, I mean when you watch it you can kind of see she doesn't really have a flair for comedy <laughs> but, uh, i'm shocked <laughs> but damn it she tried she tried <laughs> she tried pulling out all the stops um <clears throat> And this is also from my one of my favorite eras of independent exploitation and, and also the gritty New York film scene of that time. Uh, even though it tries to be a silly comedy, it still has that gross and gritty 80s New York backdrop that I love so much. Um, oh, lost my place. Okay, so sadly, director Roberta Finley retired from filmmaking after this film failed to pick up any distribution. As she told one interviewer, uh, there was no more video companies left to sell garbage to. <laughs> so if you like 80s New York sleaze films and you like over-the-top comedy, way over-the-top comedy, uh, that tries to be trauma, then you have to check out Band. Now, to this day, I don't think there is any still any physical distribution to this movie. I know Media Blasters announced years ago that they were going to do a DVD release of it, and it never came out. That's on brand for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you can find this movie on Tubi. That's where I found it. But So definitely, if you want, you want to see something really bizarre, check out Band for sure. Yeah, I've really been uh, dipping my toes into more of Roberta Finlay's uh, filmography after seeing The Tenement for the first time. So, yeah, and I figured you would appreciate this one. But have you ever seen Band, uh, Brian? I have not, but Tenement is awesome. Oh, I love, love that one. Love that one, yes. Have you, uh, you should check out A Woman's Torment if you want something really fucking sleazy. Okay. Yeah, for sure, for sure, because, uh, you know, these are the only two so far that I've seen of her filmography, and I can't wait to, to dive in more. That's, well, I mean, she worked on uh, Shriek of the Mutilated, surely you've well, seen that. Yeah, I've seen that. But the, but not that, as, her, as far as her as a director. It's yeah, that's, yeah. New stuff yeah. to you. Because yeah. that was, wasn't that directed by her husband? Yeah, or? and uh, Lurkers is really good. Primeval, though, uh, of the two devil movies she made around that time, Primeval's the better one. Check okay. that one out. For sure. Absolutely. So there you have it, folks. That's it for this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. Um, but hey, get ready, folks. 
This was two ninety nine. Oh no, that we means three hundred's coming. Three hundred is coming. That's right. This movie comes out, or movie. This uh, <laughs> this episode comes out on the third, but on uh, Sunday, November fifth at eleven a.m., you can join us. You can be on episode three hundred. Find our Facebook event. There's instructions there for you. It's not too crazy, and uh, come be on the episode. It'll be awesome. And even if you don't want to be on it video wise, you can still hang out and and talk shit in the chat because that's we know what you're going to do anyway. And so <laughs> uh, it would be great to have you there to help us uh, celebrate this milestone, episode 300. And you'll know you're at the right Facebook event because on the image it looks like Mike and Tad are pissed off that like in some oh, metal yeah. band you know they're like what are yeah. they mad about it's, <laughs> it's i saw so that funny. picture i'm like what, what? <laughs> where was it <laughs> anyway somebody snuck a pic because i don't ever i think it's a screen capture of a video right yeah yeah oh maybe. is it but uh yeah sunday november 5th 11 a.m central youtube yes please join us it's going to be a good time uh and join us like our very special guest joined us today. So thanks, Brian, for Brian Clark, being on the show. Yeah. My pleasure. Anytime. I'm always happy to be here. Say, don't say it's that. My, don't. It's my, home, it's my home away from home. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We love having you on. It's like the good old days. Yeah. Uh, so where can people find more Brian Clark? Because I know I need more in my need life. Need it. Uh, you can look me up on Facebook if you really think that's necessary. <laughs> Otherwise, you can find <laughs> You can find my books on Amazon, B-R-Y-A-N, Clark. I'm not the guy who writes gay porn. I'm the guy who writes horror. Uh, and <laughs> It's on his and, business card that says that. <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Adversion, uh, well, I guess this comes out after Halloween, so by this time this episode comes out, the album will probably be up on Sewer Rot Records on Bandcamp. Cool. Very cool. Find Brian in the sewer. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. He said, my mind's always in the gutter, so. Might, uh, <laughs> and you can find more of us on our YouTube channel, Facebook, the Tickety Talks, the X's, the Instagrams, and da, 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 Thread. Right? It's singular, not plural. It's plural. The one time I don't pluralize <laughs> I know, a word. Still don't know what you're talking God about. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks again, Brian, for being on. We love you, buddy. Love you, too. And we will talk to you all next time on Attack of the Killer Podcast. Oh, no. Could this be the end of... What?